Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Cheryl Friesen. I'm a science liaison with the Forest Service. When I gave Lena and Chris my, the title for this talk a few weeks ago, I must have been in a really good mood. And a lot of liaison work was going really well, and everyone was behaving perfectly, and relationships were clicking along. So I said, it's a magical relationship when a scientist meets a manager. Um, the few weeks, a few weeks after that, there'd been a number of things that weren't so magical and relationships that weren't working well and people that weren't playing well together. And I crossed out magical and I put in, oh, maybe challenging, maybe challenging will be the word I'll use for the talk. But as I worked through the talk and developing it, I ended up want, landing on the word powerful. And I think that's aspirational <laughs> of what I think some of these relationships could be. So that's, that's the tone I'm gonna, I decided to couch the uh, talk in instead of challenging or frustrating or making me crazy. So see what you think as we go through this. There's three things basically I wanna talk about. One is the value of, our, of the unique partnership that we have here with H.J. Andrews in telling the stories of the science. I want to talk a little bit about traditional versus today's science communication philosophies. And I want to give you some examples of, of some storytelling that I think have really caught attention and made folks care and that have shifted paradigms here in the Pacific Northwest. Now, for those of you who don't know, our partnership has a structure. It's called the Central Cascades Adaptive Management Partnership. If you were around a while back, you might remember the Cascade Center for Ecosystem Management. That was John Sissel, Fred Swanson and company back in the late 80s, 90. Um, when the Northwest Forest Plan came about, there was an adaptive management area that was plopped down over the top of the Cascade Center and the H.J. Andrews. And we ran with those two structures for a while with leaderships and programs and funding and all kinds of things going on. But when that leadership shifted, we did some revisioning. Of, well, who are we as a science management partnership here, and what do we what do we hold dear? And we revisioned ourselves into a new name, the Central Cascades Adaptive Management Partnership. And I think where we landed was that the word partnership was the most um, enduring concept of what we wanted to carry forward. It didn't really matter what we were called, as long as we were a partnership and carrying that element forward. So what CCAMP does, that's what we call ourselves, um, creates opportunities for scientists and managers to engage in mutual learning and solution exploration. And this is actually a very, um, it's an unusual endeavor. When I talk with other ecologists throughout the country, I don't hear of these sorts of relationships. Um, we have a lot of the traditional sorts of things that we do for mutual learning. The field trips, discussion forums, workshops, syntheses, demonstrations, administrative studies, all those kinds of things. But what we also try to make time for is what I, I like to call unstructured playtime, which is just this opportunity for scientists and managers to get together and, and share ideas and kind of cook on things and, and get mutually different views of each other's perspectives. And it really helps with relationship building. Now this flies very much in the face of traditional science communication. Um, in the past, science, well, I shouldn't say in the past, it still happens today. Science and the communication of it is often something that isn't considered until the end of the research project. Um, it's a one-way flow of information from scientists to the public or the manager in an audience. There's even a section in the NSF 2012 um, Science Becoming a Messenger series where they talked about the idea of science ninjas, <laughs> where they were encouraging scientists to, to develop this capability to stealthily force the audience to care about their science. And that's, that's not how we want to roll here. <laughs> but you can see where it comes from. Most of us on the management side, the only interactions we've had in our lifetime with PhD people has been in this classroom type of setting, where you have this authoritarian person standing at the front of the room, usually an old white male, sorry Fred, usually an old white male <laughs> who's delivering information that we're reacting to and probably stressing about and then going to be tested about. This isn't a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. This is not the beginning of, of successful communication into the future. Um, there was a, a gentleman named Gross in 1944 that talked about this communication in two different theories uh, or different models. One is a deficit model which assumes a passive and trusting audience. It imagines the communication flowing one way from the experts to the audience. 
And I think what we've been trying to promote with C-Camp is this contextual model where you've got interaction in a two-way in a two-way way. way. Um, you're emphasizing the importance of trust. You'd be surprised at how many managers don't trust scientists and vice versa. We need to work on that. We're looking to frame the information so that it's relevant to particular audiences. And we don't want that audience to be simply an empty vessel that sits and accepts what the scientist has to say without ever questioning it. And when I first interviewed for this job, actually Fred Swanson was on the panel and one of the questions was, so Cheryl, how do you develop and maintain relationships in a science management partnership? <laughs> and I, I don't know, uh, go out for a beer? Um, I, it just totally stumped me that one of the questions would be about relationships. Um, since then, I've seen the real value of it. We can call it breaking bread. Back in the day, we called it spit and whittle time. Um, kicking dirt on a landing. Some of you have probably done that. As I'm going to more collaborative events, we have this new term called swapping palm sweat. It's just meeting people, you know, just, just getting out there and having some face-to-face -face time and how important that is in relationship building. So to me, C-Camp's strength is that we're operating in that framework of a peer-to-peer -peer partnership around science sharing. And when I take your science out, I'm usually framing it in, a, in two different ways. Um, one, I, I'm usually going out with the wow reallys. <laughs> I'm going out with the, the, ooh, this is really cool kind of stuff that grabs people's attention. People are also very interested in, in information that debunks conventional wisdom. And when you start getting that, oh, really, wow, really, and debunking conventional wisdom, that's when the paradigms start to shift. You get enough momentum. And I'll give you some examples of some of these are stories only time could tell um, that we've been able to tell just because of our partnership. For example, um, we do a lot of water research in partnership with the H.J. Andrews and the agencies. A lot of complexity is coming out of water science. Um, just listening to the, a couple of the previous speakers ago, my goodness, that's, I'm not sure I understood half of what she had to say. Uh, sorry, Elba. <laughs> trying to get it, really it was. Very complicated stuff about water in that story she was telling. When I've gone out with some of these water with some of these water science pieces of information, and I'm looking for the wow reallys, I find stories like this. Um, I think this is a Gordon Grant story. It can take over five years for a snowflake on the Three Sisters to get to the Mackenzie River. Well, that grabs some attention. That makes somebody think about the system and what's going on out there in a way differently than they might have previously. Another story, 40% of rain that falls in the Cascades is transpired by the trees back into the atmosphere. This was uh, Steve Wanzell responding to, does water run downhill? Well, not really. <laughs> it runs in a lot of different directions. But that's a, that's a piece of information, very technical science information, that tells a very compelling story and gets people to think about how does that system work. Another emphasis area for us is young stand thinning. Um, got a lot, of, a lot of acres out there that we're thinning in different ways and trying to understand what the consequences are. Very interesting debunking of conventional wisdom here. Well, there were a couple of things. One, back in the day, we thought if we thinned all those, they would all fall down. They didn't. 20 years ago, those, those stands are still there. But the idea that flying squirrels were not happy in a, stand ex in a stem exclusion type of a habitat was such a piece of conventional wisdom, there was actually a cartoon about it in a forestry book. Well, it turns out that's not true. There's more flying squirrels in the unthinned stand than in a thin stand. What does that mean? That's just conventional wisdom being, being kind of blown, blown away and making us think very differently about what our actions are. This is a story that was started 20 years ago with Brenda McComb when we first started the, the Young Stand Thinning and Diversity Study. Stream management is another research partnership area. A lot of complexities of how you do restoration in streams. A lot of work has gone on that over the year. A lot of it has come out of the Andrews been a series of debunking that's come out of this through stories out of this. Um, sometimes it takes more than one shot to debunk something. <laughs> uh, stream cleaning was good there for a while. Remember those days? And then stream cleaning became bad. Then stream bondage became good. We were cabling everything down. And then stream bondage became bad. And now we're going through this paradigm shift where we're looking at focusing on, um, focusing on processes and functions 
and not so much the structures that we've always prided ourselves on being able to stick in the stream and count. And this is very controversial, this, this shift of this paradigm. And there's a lot of standing on landings and kicking dirt going on about this that's causing some people to really rethink how they think. Another partnership emphasis area is climate change. And there's a lot of cool stuff coming out of the H.D. Andrews. It's very complicated. And it's hard sometimes to pull the stories out of that. Um, the one I like the most, it's actually not on H.G. Andrews, but as a partner scientist of yours, Joan Hagar, looking at pica. And the, the theory was that pica are just going to be like squoze off the top of mountains as the climate warms and this high elevation species has nowhere else to go. Well, it turns out actually we're finding them in, in railroad um, rebutments down outside of Oak Ridge. Uh, it turns out they're actually a much more adaptable species than anybody might have previously thought. And there's a really good paper that just came out about thinking about adaptive capacity as we're looking at effects of climate change. And this is just a really good example of that, where we didn't think about the species' ability possibly to, to adapt. Another partnership area, of course, this is, a big, this is the big one. Steve Akers and company there from H.J. Andrews, um, the spotted owl. Conventional wisdom, spotted owl decline is a habitat issue. Quit cutting habitat and you'll be perfectly fine. Well, no. <laughs> As we watch the story over the years and it's unfolded, there's other compounding elements in there that make it a much more complicated picture. That's a really wow, really. This is causing tremendous um, angst <laughs> with a lot of folks. I think um, Actually, the BLM plan revision, one of their requirements is going to be that they are involved with spart owl removal in order to have a decision signed. So this is, this is big stuff. Early seral habitats, Bat Betz's story and others, um, looking at that stage that conventional wisdom used to say, let's just get through this, pound through it as fast as we possibly can. It's worthless. It's a desert. We need to get more conifers in there. We need to get it growing. Well, now it turns out that it's an extremely rich environment for all kinds of things, some of which are in decline. And if this isn't a paradigm shift in the Pacific Northwest, um, you haven't been paying attention. This is huge as well. Uh, East Coast has already gone through this with the brush rabbit. They were a couple of decades ahead of us in thinking about and experiencing this paradigm shift, and now we're stepping into it. That's a major wow, really, there. Another partnership emphasis area is the social framework. Um, some of you might have seen this, this billboard up on the freeway when, <laughs> when um, Norm and Jerry were running around causing trouble. Um, the whole, social, whole social, social framework. The conventional wisdom is that the invisible middle is populated by neutral or moderate people. A lot of managers are hanging the hat on the idea that, ooh, if we could just reach those folks, they would fall in line behind us, and then we would be OK and have social li license to do what we want to do. I, I think we're going to be you know, stepping into a pretty big paradigm shift here soon <laughs> when we realize through work like Michael's and Hannah's and others that it's a lot more complex in that middle than, than we're willing to give it credit for. One more emphasis area, biodiversity. You know, H.J. Andrews has been uh, They've been renowned for their biodiversity research for years and years and years. And I don't have a conventional wisdom busting out of that at this point. I just have an oh, wow. <laughs> just an oh, wow. This is an Andy Muldenke story. When you stand in an old growth forest, there are 16,000 invertebrates in the square foot under your shoes. Now, when I go out in the field with just about anybody and I throw out that oh, wow, really, it just, it snaps people into attention and makes them start thinking about the complexity of that system and what they can see and can't see. And maybe they should appreciate it a little bit more because of its complexity. But it's in a very intriguing piece of information and a story. So I just want to emphasize through this talk that I think the part, this partnership will only grow in importance. We need to keep telling these stories. It's the way we're going to engage a public that needs to care. Uh, we want our work to be consequential in shaping the human understanding and decisions that are being made about our natural resources. If nobody knows, it won't matter. <laughs> I hate to tell you how many master's students I've talked to, and they defend their thesis, and then they, they move on. They never share it with anybody. They never talk about it. They don't publish it. It goes in the library, and it sits there. I think we need to be a lot more intentional about how we get our science out into the hands of the, of, of the big, wide, big wide world. 
So I'll just leave you with thousands of decisions are made every day. Um, let's make sure our story is part of that process. And let's do it in this framework of being partners in discovery and partners in developing this common understanding. Because scientists can't do it all on their own. Managers can't do it all on their own. We really need to work together in order to, to, to really affect what happens out on the ground and to shift, shift paradigms and to shift philosophies. And I think I just got the one minute card. So this is what we know. This is why we should care. And let's work together to find a way forward. Thank you. <laughs>